Marvel has a villain problem. Let's just be straight yeah. about that. It's Thursday. Um, mm-hmm. In my opinion, they got the best villains in comics, yeah. and we're just not getting them on screen. No. All right, welcome to Comics Asylum Podcast. Uh, my name is Steve. Hey guys, I'm Vaughn. All right, and we're kind of changing things up a little bit this week where normally we would have a celebrity interview, uh, someone from the industry, but today it's just gonna be Vaughn and I, uh, and we're gonna be talking about some of the stuff that we're reading, uh, taking a look at Marvels, because we both had a chance to see it last night, um, as well as looking at what we're doing with Atrium and how we're packaging it and getting it ready to be sent off to our, our backers, which hopefully will be in the next couple of weeks. Oh yeah, for sure. At this point in time, we just got the word down today that um, whenever you guys see this, but um, it's being shipped to us as we speak right now. All right. So, yes, <laughs> yes. yes, yes. Yeah. God forbid anything happens, you know, who, who remains, snaps the world <laughs> out of existence or some shit like that. You know, it's not going to be one of those situations. Well, but I think we have pretty good chances that it'll get to us unscratched. Yeah. No, no. It's, uh, it's kind of, it's interesting just waiting for it to come along it's been a long kind of process and so this is kind of like the last little bit you know waiting for it to end up in our hands it's uh, it's pretty exciting ADD kicks in heavy when you're just checking the UPS even though you know it's still in progress (laughs) so it's it's, it's one of those wild things right yeah is it here is it here yet is it here yet right so it's gonna be a lot of well let's kick things off with marvels um okay. i had a chance to see it last night oh did you uh, okay yeah and have you seen it yet yeah i saw it i saw it last night around 7 p.m so i went with yeah. the buddy of mine here down in the hammer for right. all you people that know you know right. right and uh i saw it in toronto and i'll let you start one what do you what do you think of uh, it? so i got a think again as to the last four Marvel movies and I gotta say out of all of them I didn't mind this because I kind of more expectations of I kind of did like the 90s thing I kind of checked my brain at the door knowing that I was going to go in it's like you like 90s you knew it was action you know what you're getting you know Van Damme wasn't going to put a, an amazing performance or whatever right so you just kind of went in <laughs> looking for what you're looking for right so it was kind of like that and uh I had a good time I mean what's her name uh the Toronto kid, the girl, uh, Aman, I think Iman, her name yeah. is. Yeah, she's great. She saves the movie yeah. by Aman, right? Yeah, yeah. She, she, she brings so much energy to her role. Oh, yeah. Like, and, and I will say this before, not to cut you off or, or oh, get your train of thought out of, out of whack. I thought that the chemistry between the three leads was really good. Yeah. Right? I'll, I'll give you my kind of, like, my take on what could have been kind of spiced up a little bit more. But yeah. I, but I was, I was sold on the chemistry between the three, right? And she definitely carried the same kind of energy that she brought to Miss Marvel, yeah. uh, into this flick. Like it was, yeah, it was totally. fun. And the, thing about, and the thing about it too is, I didn't like Miss Marvel, because like the first episode was good, and then afterwards, I don't care what anybody said. That was such a disbroken, convoluted mess. Based on you could tell that there was either more episodes that they didn't work out in the edit or something like that. And they have to cut it down. And I think this movie is a little bit the same. I think this is the shortest movie in this phase so far. And I definitely feel like they could have done with maybe at least another 10 to 15 minutes to kind of flush out some things. And that's just like bad continuity errors as well, too, somewhere in some of the shots that they did. But overall, I like it. I mean, I think I like it better than, what was the last one? Liked it better than Thor. Uh, Liked it better than Doctor Strange. What about Guardians? Guardians was, was Guardian uh, was Guardian. I think Guardians was was yeah, probably the last one. The last one, yeah. Um, no, I didn't like it better than Guardians. Guardians actually was pretty good. Guardians three was actually pretty good. I mean, it's a little bit heavy, but it was good um, right. overall, right? So, but um, I didn't mind it. I mean, a lot of people on online are gonna dog it and say Brie Larson. She must be like Satan's cousin or something like that because people are just going in on her. But other than that, I don't have a problem with her. Uh, I know her from way back when from. Um, Oh, was it something with Tara? Where she had, she was the daughter of the, the character with multiple United States of the United States of United Tara, States I think. Power. Yeah, yeah. With Tony, is that Tony Collette? Yeah, it was Tony Collette on right. Showtime, and that was right. a great, that was a great show, and that's where I first knew her from. I think for and, me, it was Twenty One Jump Street. I think the first okay, one. I don't. You know what the thing is? I never remember that she's in that movie. Right. 
never knew. But uh, she's come a long way. But I didn't she, mind. You it. know what? She's great in lessons in chemistry right now on oh. Apple. Oh, yeah? I think it's on Apple. Um, oh, yeah, she's really that. good I in that one. That's the period piece one too, right? It's a little yeah, bit different. Yeah, it's kind of like Mad Men meets Julia Child kind of. Um, so, I mean, I have like I have no problem with it. It's almost funny. I think she actually probably has the least amount of lines in that movie when you look at it compared to Aman and um, uh, what, Proton or whatever? The other? Photon. Um, Photon, yeah. The actress's name slips my mind at the moment. That slips my mind, too. But she, everybody seems to be doing more than her in regards to the movie. And that's where I feel like it could have done better with at least another five to 10 minutes of story patching out, right? Classic Marvel, villains a little bit super forgettable. Like there's nothing about it. It's just a means to an end in regards to the story. Yeah, right? you got, you, you're you're absolutely correct there um, because my, like I enjoyed it, yeah. right? Um, I totally enjoyed it. My issue with the entire film, you touched on already, like, Marvel has a villain problem. Let's just be straight yeah. about that. It's clear as day. Um, yeah. In my opinion, they got the best villains in comics, yeah. and we're just not getting them on screen, no. right? Um, and then for me, it, it like I don't mind that it was short. I kind of liked it. It, it. it was never a point where I turned around and went, "When is this over?" So it kept yeah. moving. I liked it. Yeah. I just thought that. The interaction between Carol and Monica Rambo, they they are needed to be more, just even like two or three more bits of dialogue, yeah, to like kind of to, to kind of get into the relationship as to you know why they were the way that they were together. Yeah, the angst between the two of them. Yeah, yeah, they, it was almost it was almost like you know like in a soap opera, like if you're like a a YNR fan or a Days of Our Lives fan, where it's someone delivers a line then turns away from the camera and walks out the door or something or they cut to commercial it almost mm. seemed like the scenes were short like that there there wasn't that kind of back and forth where the actors had a had a chance to kind of like chew some scenery on each other mm -hmm. right so that's that's i guess i guess the writer in me was like i wanted to see more of that yeah especially since the chemistry was so good the only person i guess to chew anything is uh Iman, right she kills all of her scenes but other than that I mean, yeah. I like the villain as well too. She's good in her role. I don't know what her her overall end goal was in some of the ways. Like it didn't seem straightforward enough to me. Like it seemed like it was almost like a she was kind of terraforming things. Like I don't want to give it away, but like it's a little bit it's a little bit light in regards to motivations, right? So yeah, but that's just right. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I know that. It's one of those, not to give anything away, but it's one yeah. of those things where, and I think this is a theme that's been running through a lot of the MCU, mm -hmm. where the heroes are not necessarily heroic. They're almost trying to uh, make up for their mistakes. Yeah, That seems to be a lot of what's yeah. going on, as opposed to at least the books that we read growing up. There's a threat. They have to go stop it. And the threat mm -hmm. wasn't necessarily directly related to them. It yeah. was a, just a threat and they had to go stop it. But yeah. a lot Everything. of, yeah, there's a lot of soul okay. searching yeah. in uh, on the hero's part for actions mm -hmm. they've done. Yeah. Um, it's almost like it's a Peter Parker moment for everybody, right? <laughs> Good old Pete. Yeah. Pete, Pete, Pete. Yeah, no. But I mean, overall, I can't say like, I, I think it's stood, well, stood up better than Thor and it stood up better than yeah. Multiverse of Madness, I feel at least. Um, but yes, yeah. uh, so it, it's hard, right? And I mean, it's and now that they're introducing some new stuff that um, I just read today that they pushed a whole bunch of best stuff back to 2025 now, right? So none of that stuff is going to get like there's storylines that still haven't gotten wrapped up. Like, where's Vision? What's he up to? Right? So you're going to be like, we're going to be the next 10 years just trying to wrap up storylines from the last six months like is that that's how slow it's weird because it's slow moving but at the same time too i feel like they're doing too much on some of these movies and the television shows so it'll be interesting to see how it plans out it plays out in the, in the overall but um i'm trying to keep my faith I'm trying to keep my faith 
Honestly. Well, yeah, uh, I will say if you're going to go see it, go see it for uh, Brie, Iman, and Tayana. The three yeah. leads are fantastic. Um, the story is the story, yeah. right? It, it just is what it is. Uh, yeah, and it's not, don't go in there looking for anything kind of heavy or earth shattering to move the universe along, the MCU along. But if yeah. you're going just for a good time, um, I would totally recommend it. And speaking of the MCU in terms of television, mm -hmm. I had a chance to watch Loki last night and okay. it was it was great. It yeah, was a lot great. of people, I haven't gotten a chance to see all of it yet, but so far I'll watch them all now that it's all done. I'll binge watch some of it this weekend. Um, but I know a lot of people have said that um, my one buddy that I went to go see uh, Marvels with last night, he says he likes it better than season one in a lot of ways. So it's uh, it's interesting how people can say that. And I thought season one was pretty good. So I know a lot of people didn't, you know, I mean, feel it. But I, I so I'm 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 eager to see it. I'm really eager to see it. Yeah, it's so. kind of like uh, if you did the MCU, uh, if you did Doctor Who with the MCU's budget, okay. kind of. Yeah. That's the feeling that I I got from it watching the two seasons, mm -hmm. and and I know you can explore more in twelve eps versus you know hour and a half. But Loki is an intrinsic part of the M MCU, and mm -hmm. Hiddleston is fantastic in the in the role, mm -hmm. and and they hit a lot of really interesting, like like story beats and character beats with him, that mm -hmm. I think it's totally satisfying. Um, it was cool. it was really good, and and it's got one of the most banging scores. Like the Loki theme to me is one oh, of yeah. the best. The yeah. best scores, best themes out there. And I think mm -hmm. Marvel has kind of dropped the ball with their themes. Yeah. Um, you know. So when that's combined with the pathos of the story and everything else, it's really good. It's it's really rewarding viewing. That's good to hear. Like right now, I'm only you know, when I listen to soundtracks, that's kind of my go-to work themes. I listen to the original Avengers, Endgame, and then the Loki season one soundtrack. Those so are my model one. So it's like yeah. the Christopher Nolan Batman's got pushed out of your workflow? No, he's he's in there, but like I'm talking like Marvel themed ones. Right. But, right, right, but right. Batman's in there. For sure. Batman's in there. Um uh what Dark Knight Returns. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. One of our personal faves as a film. Personal faves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so sure. uh, they're in there. Uh the Tron soundtrack, that's in there as well, too. That's a big one for me. Right. 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 But, um I mean the movie itself is whatever, but um the soundtrack is great. The guys killed the soundtrack. But yeah, so that's good to know though. I'm gonna check it out. I'll probably binge watch it this weekend if I get a chance, right? But um right now, my big thing right now is trying to get my head back around this whole kind of getting back into the comic book industry now with this whole publishing thing. So I've been kind of keeping tabs on a little bit more of everybody and kind of get back into my reading mode. So um yeah, but we'll see. We're kind of Moving on to the next thing, I guess. I don't know. What are we talking about next? Uh, so well, I speak, wanted... Speaking of comics, let's go to that. Yeah, one. speaking of comics, yeah. So I wanted to talk about the whole idea of... Um, we're a little bit late on this one, but I think it's a still a pretty prevalent topic is um, the new thing of, uh, if you don't know, uh, New York Comic Con was just passed probably about in a New month. In New York. New York. In New York, right? And uh, there was a big announcement down there that um, Ghost Machine a new imprint for Image Comics was starting up with a pretty heavy hitters kind of lining up the core uh, core makeup and they're going to be exclusive to that title for, I guess, the foreseeable future, at mm -hmm. least for the two to five years, I think they said, right? And some of the media, but just kind of open-ended. But really what they're trying to do is they're trying to kind of make their own imprint. It's kind of a throwback to what, I guess, what was the 93, 92 when... The original image guys formed image and tried to go out on their own and do their own things. The industry's in such a state right now. I think a lot of these guys are trying to make their push, right? So, but I think it's um, and it's an interesting thing. I, I don't know what you think about it in the overall. Like you, you saw it as well too. Um, do you have any takeaways from it? Well, especially now that we're in the indie scene, right? It yeah. it, it hits a little bit different. Um, but I think that anytime creators have a chance to kind of you know, guide or steer their own ship. Mm. That's for the best. Um, and with a pub, with a creator friendly uh, imprint such as Image, you know, I don't think that it's a it's a it's a bad move. Uh, I think it's it's going to be interesting to see what they what they produce, especially with the talent that they have 
on the roster because yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's like it's Jeff Johns and Gary Frank and Jason Fabrock and Francis Manipal. So there's a whole bunch of amazing creators that yeah. are going to be either continuing stuff that's already been started or coming up with new new titles and ideas in 2024. Um, the thing that I'm not quite sure how it's going to like change the the landscape is I still think that the big two are the engines that drive the bus, so to mm -hmm. speak. And they're what gets people into, into comic book stores. Mm -hmm. um, and so if Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman and, you know, those kind of titles are selling well, then you'll pick up any other titles that are coming out from independence through there. Um, so I'm not quite sure, other than having another amazing outlet for for creatives to kind of do their thing, I'm not sure what kind of blip it's going to cause on the um, on the overall landscape. Yeah, that's a good thing. The only thing that blip that I could see that it causes is that you're the big two are out of some exclusivities for a while, right? So it's gonna be interesting to see how they dig into their bag to fill that hole with guys like. Um, Jason Fabrock and um, even the big one, uh, Jeff Johns, right? He's going to be off the table for a while. He's been notorious for a DC guy, right? Mm -hmm. I, well, he was an executive for a while over there. Um, yeah, wasn't, he, he, wasn't he involved with uh, some of the film? Yeah, so he was like one of the film execs for a while. He moved over to the entertainment side and he was championing in that for a while in the whole idea of migrating some of the content from print over into practical medias right so he was that he was spearheading that for a while so it's gonna be interesting to see how they pivot but i mean dc and those guys have kind of done a whole restructuring in the last year or so with the with the with james gunn and those guys over there right so i don't um it might be a situation where he's out and that's kind of part of the whole thing where this is what has spurred this a little bit to push this forward a little bit more right like i'm just hypothesizing right but it's kind of interesting because for the last little while, you haven't heard much about him or even Jim Lee. Like Jim Lee's over there, but outside of doing covers, I have no idea what Jim does. Like no, like no, nothing about Jim Lee or whatnot, right? But it's like, it's always amazing to see like almost the figureheads of some of these things and um, yet they're not producing, right? Like when was the last time we saw Jim in a regular book, right? Good question. Right. Outside of some covers here and there and specialty covers, I think you're doing a lot of development stuff behind the scenes, but it's gone to the days when you used to have artists, you know, putting out two books a month in the early, like the mid 90s and late 80s of Marvel, where you had guys bagging up. You used to have books like bi monthly, right? At one point in time. I'll, I'll, I'll never forget back in the day where. Mark Bagley was doing bi-weekly Spider-Man issues. <laughs> yeah, that, like that guy. That, that that guy was just a machine, oh, right? Yeah. And McFarlane was doing Hulk and Spider-Man, I think, at the same in the same month. Yeah, okay, yeah. I know John Rita Jr. used to do it. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna argue that it's the art nowadays, though, is so complex and so heavy mm -hmm. that it's not like every like every panel is a work of mm -hmm. art in a lot of cases a lot of backgrounds mm -hmm. and so you know it's it's hard for artists to kind of give you six issues in a row much less what was the run that some of those guys would have given you like you know three years of a book three six straight right. issues with yeah. maybe one fill-in i just yeah. think that it's different nowadays um just the a level of detail that goes into each page it's a lot a lot but it's it's weird too though because i think about the fact that um with the technology and everything right and you have colorists that can bang out colors pretty fast so and all these things at your fingertips like i get there's still a lot of work and the level of threshold of the work that's being produced but it's you'd almost feel like some of that stuff would become somewhat easier you know what in some ways right like that that age-old classic debate that all my friends have is is it easier on to get on now as a musician or is it easier to do stuff before, right? Like it's 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 a weird call, right? 
Well, it's um, easier. It's easier to do things independently because yeah. distribution's king. Whether it's film, it, well, that's you know, comics is in the same boat. You can yeah. make it, but if there's no way to get it to the public, then you know that's your hurdle. So yeah. you you can make records. You can go be in a band and and play your hearts out. You know, get gigs. But if you have no way to press your your music onto either an LP or showing your age, although it's coming back now, <laughs> or onto a tape or onto a CD, and then yeah. get it out to the masses, right? Yeah, it's it's difficult. And so comics like. Thankfully, Indiegogo and Zoop and Kickstarter exist for comics. Yeah. If you're not, you know, going to be playing in the in the uh, playing in the the diamond arena. Yeah. But there are yeah. a lot of fantastic creators that are using Kickstarter and then just going straight to their backers. Oh, totally. Right? And so in that way, it's easier. And then you mm -hmm. don't have like the monthly pressures because you're just making books and putting them out and making books and, you know, whenever your Kickstarter is ready. But mm -hmm. when you're on that every four to six weeks grind, right? And, and a lot of these artists who are able to use Kickstarter don't have to worry about like editorial, yeah, you know, changing things midstream or getting scripts late and then having to rush. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's a different, it's a totally different kind of work environment. Yeah, different, different animal altogether. I totally get that. I totally get that. We're not. And with that being said, that kind of brings up the indie stuff, which kind of works out perfectly in regards to our. Um, you want to do the hot books, or do you want to do talking about just the indie packaging and stuff that we did for our book? Well, kind of... it's up to you. I'll let you can you can take it whichever way you want. All right. So I guess with that being said, I'm going to just get into some books that I've been reading. Actually, two of them are indie books. And I want to kind of start featuring indie books more heavily because I'm trying to play in the indie space as well too. So kind of know your medium in that sense, right? So I just got this one in the other day. I backed it a couple of months ago and they had a pretty good turnaround. I think I backed it in, I want to say August or September. And I've already gotten the books in my hand. So this one is Clash of the Cryptids. Um, it's done by Afterlight Comics. They're a UK, um, UK independent indie publisher. And it's a great little book. It's a great little book. Uh, production value is pretty good. Um, overall, like I was saying before, I'm not a big horror person, but I do have to appreciate that these guys tell a good story, right? It's a little bit more like Bloomhouse in a lot of ways of how they're telling their stories. But it's like the old days of comics as well, too, where they're actually, you know, um, there's actually a lot of story in there. It's not like two or three, like no action panels per se. It's actually a pretty heavy story driven um kind of arc right so it's about a father that's trying to save his son and he goes to any means that he can to make sure that he helps his son out and that leads him down some um treacherous paths in regards to that and stuff and whatnot so good book good book i mean art's not really where i would like it to be but um, that's not my that's just a preference thing but um overall i have no problem with it uh the production's fine they put out a good product over the, overall in the end so uh, yeah, that's Clash of the Cryptids. So if you guys want to check them out, uh, we'll have a link in the um, in the description below as well too. If you guys want to kind of check them out and see what they're doing out there, and then um, you want to go on yours, and then we'll kind of ping pong, ping pong back and forth. Uh, sure. Uh, I'm reading uh, the Incredible Hulk. I guess the relaunch of the Incredible Hulk, and it's interesting because I didn't, I wasn't up on Immortal Hulk, but I kind of knew what was going on. Um, mm. just by checking stuff on YouTube or Twitter, and mm -hmm. being a longtime Hulk fan, I'm always interested in you know how they're trying to reinvent the character, and I have to say that they're they're taking a very um, it's a horror bent, keeping in the horror vein of their your last book, okay. and it's it's ba this book's basically a horror book, and mm -hmm. um, dealing with a lot of like the the green door and the one above all and the one below all and the Hulk's connection to it. And it's, it's really good. Um, I'm really enjoying it. It's, it's interesting because for me, my main question is with everything that has happened to the, to the Hulk recently, where does that leave Banner? Hmm. Right. Cause I've always, I've always liked Banner as a character. Um, not so much the broken version of him, but just the, the, the dude who's trying to deal with the monster 
inside mm -hmm. of you. And so this book, it's posing, it's starting to pose those kind of questions. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see where, I think in issue five, they actually post that question. It's, and it's, um, so it's going to be very interesting to see, you know, where they take it. Is it a limited series or is it ongoing? That's so a good far? question. I'm assuming it's an ongoing um, yeah. because I don't know the, to be honest with you, they just dropped, um, they just dropped the cover for issue nine by Greg Capullo. Oh, wow. yeah, that was a great cover. And I can't, I can't lie. Yeah. It's hard to say that a guy who has drawn one picture of a character is in the all time list of best Hulk artists. But Capullo's cover is so good. <laughs> that oh, yeah, it's, 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 it's like, okay, yeah. take my money well, now. Picture. Right, yeah, content sure. and and to make things even better, um, there's a new artist on the scene, a guy named Danny Earls. Mm -hmm. He's doing the interiors for those issues. Yeah. Um, man, can't wait to see it because that, that that guy, his art rocks as well too. I think the, the, the yeah the current artist is uh, Nick Klein, and he's doing a great job on it. Mm -hmm. But when I saw that Capullo co cover, I was like, hmm. yeah. Hmm. Well, he did a bunch of Wolverine covers too. So they got him doing heavy cover work, it seems, for 2024. Yeah. And it's like when Sylvester came back to Wolverine for a second there, I was like, okay, I could I could get this book. But seeing that they're only doing the covers, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. But uh, the Wolverine one was pretty banging too. But I saw that Hulk. And whoever colored that Hulk, that, that, that yeah, was no, amazing. Production, production, production on the book is great. Yeah. So that's going to be interesting. I'm hoping the story's thing. So I'll check it out for sure. Yeah. I'll check it out for sure as well too, but that's good to hear. That's good to hear. Yeah, it's it's interesting to think because Greg hasn't been back to Marvel. Like he's doing a stint on Marvel, he hasn't been back to Marvel since I would say ninety three or ninety four. I think that long, huh? Yeah, because he so the original Image guys left, and then he did some fill in stuff afterwards, and he did uh, X Force and some other stuff, and that's where I know him from. I think it was. And then after a little while after that, he ended up at Spawn. And he's been at Spawn and then jumping about after that ever since. And then he was at mm -hmm. DC for whoever knows how long, right? So it's been a while right. since he and then since he's been back at Marvel. So that'll be interesting to see. Hopefully that moves the needle a little bit in regards to Marvel getting some numbers on in their favor for some of their top books. We'll see. So we'll, we'll see. That's gonna be a thing. But then um so on me, I have this one. So this is another one that's, um, this one's a couple of, um, I think almost like in the first quarter of this year, I picked this up and that's when we were kind of getting our heads around the whole Kickstarter thing. So it's in the vein of supporting indie and stuff like that. But also it was just a killer book. And I liked Carl based on when he was doing his flash stuff a couple of years ago. So I always liked his art overall. What I didn't know was this actually was a webtoon book initially for a while there. And, and then it came Death Chan's a Tanager, correct, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Death Chan. Uh, it was a webtoon, then it came out as a collected. And uh, what's nice is and dif different. It has a lot of um a lot of anime vibes in the sense that it's all black and white with heavy zip tones and, and like streak lines and energy. And then in the back end, it's a little bit more traditional style that he does for his mainstream stuff, but the front end of the book, and then is all black and white. And then the back end is color and it's almost like his normal style, but that's also black and white. So sorry, flashbacks. So that part of the book is actually kind of like a throwback. So it's kind of weird how it works, but it, it's a little nice little kind of, I guess, dichotomy of it. So it works really well in regards to the two styles are so different from each other, but it's still the same artist. So it really works, but it's going to be interesting to see when we actually see the issue two, because I think he's drawing webtoon right now for issue two but i haven't looked at it in a while so it's going to be hopefully it comes out next year but a great book quality book and shout out to him he helped us a little bit in regards to when we needed to know a little bit more about our packaging um issues when we came to logistics and shipping uh he put us on to a great shipping company us local it's where we could actually get one get our books out as well too so um that was great of him and he didn't need to do that but he was all willing more than willing to help us out so yeah that's no, great. So, no a huge solid to Thanks. Carl, for sure. Uh, on my end, I'm I'm not finished the series yet, but I'm yeah. thoroughly enjoying Dead Romance. I think I have issue five and six um, to read, and that's by Fred Kennedy and Nick um, Rinkovich. And mm. it's a sword and sandals tale uh, about uh, Arminius, a Germanic prince raised in Rome, 
who has sworn vengeance against uh, the empire that butchers his people. And so he kidnaps um, this woman, uh, Heronia, who he wants to make um, his queen. And she too is a slave. And now mm -hmm. he, there's a whole bunch of Romans that are coming down the pipe um, who will die to give her the throne, as the blurb says, that she never asked for. So it's mm -hmm. it's great. Um, Marinkovich's art is is it's dark um it's it's lush at the same time and and Kennedy's weaving a great tale um yeah. and if you like gladiator or anything like that you can totally see this being um you know on the big screen in in that vein it's a it's a good read I'm really enjoying it yeah I saw it I gotta pick up my other books there's probably sitting at my local comic store right now because I, I think I picked up the last three but I haven't gotten caught up mm -hmm. yet and I haven't really gotten a chance to fully read them all right but I, I love the art based on it reminds me a lot of a Jay Lee mixed with like a jock mixed with like yeah. a you know what I mean yeah yeah so, definitely it has a lot of that just like the dark lines and the real scratchiness of it all right mm -hmm. so interesting is that is it just more fictional but historic or is no, it based no on... it's it's based on a real story so i'm sure you can classify it as historical fiction yeah um but it definitely has its it has its roots in history for okay sure. oh, cool. that's interesting yeah. i didn't know as, as far as i as far as i know okay. um fred if i'm if i'm incorrect please you know let, <laughs> let me know next time um, you see him in, yeah in the next hall. time i see you <laughs> you can let me know um but as far as i know it's connected to uh actual events based on actual okay. events based, based on thing. actual events you know yeah. how that works <laughs> so yeah no but it's great like it's like i have to say that for an industry that everyone is kind of you know unloading on yeah there's some great product being put out there like, like i would yeah you know I, and i'm not saying because i'm not reading necessarily batman or or those kind of titles mm -hmm. but some of the kickstarters that we have um supported yeah. Some of the indie stuff, some stuff out of Image, you know, a couple of titles out of the big two. Yeah. Uh, some great storytelling. And like Titan, I just picked up the Titan uh, reissue of, or relaunch, I guess, of Conan the Barbarian. Oh, yeah, you're saying, yeah. And it's like someone taught, got John Bershema and, and Roy Thomas, I guess he was doing those books. They were doing those books and are basically updating it for 2024. Like they're just reissuing that time period in new material it's great the creative team is on point um the artist whose name escapes me right now is, is, that, that, is that the guy that used to i don't know the artist but i know the one of the guys that's doing the covers i think he used to do some x-men covers the the i think the the variant that i have is a dan panosian um, okay yeah dan panosian. Well, Dan's always the good, interior yeah. art get the guy oh it's, it's it's basically looking like at new john bashema um yeah artwork so okay. you know like they're across the board there are a lot of tales and you see a lot too like when you're going through kickstarter um not so much on indiegogo but when you go through kickstarter and you look at all the different titles yeah. that are trying to be funded um there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff in the indie scene that's mm -hmm. very interesting and quite appealing and you know all obviously in the mainstream there's still titles that are really good so it's unfortunate that the industry's in in a bit of a downturn and things yeah. are not necessarily imploding. Well, I guess you can say they're imploding, especially if you own a uh, an LCS, a local comic yeah, like shop. shop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and hopefully, there's a way to save it and and get it to bounce back. It's it's almost like comics Ragnarok, where yeah. every little while there's a boom, and then the Midgard comic book serpent comes to eat itself and destroy yeah, it the industry. Right? It seems it's to be so, but but every time it's not even just a downturn. It's like this is the end. Yeah. Oh, totally. This is the end. <laughs> Remember Never that time when all the like the last bit of comic books ever. Yeah. And then something happens, it kick starts it, jump starts it, and then there's a boom again. Um, so hopefully that's not the the life cycle of the industry yeah. going forward. Mm -hmm. And we can you know find a happy medium where you know things are are healthy for everyone involved, creators, mm -hmm. distributors, and the companies as well, too. Um mm -hmm. so Hopefully, but for sure, when it comes to product, there's a lot of very interesting stories out there. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think it's even more so because things are so readily accessible in the market and people are creating content in such waves now. Like mm -hmm. everybody is just like art is out there 
in droves, right? Like yeah, a lot of artists, lot of talent, a lot of talented artists, lot of talent, you know, right? some some good writers. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing about it too is so much easily to get ex access to things. So people are learning at such a exponential rate, right? The art's getting better and better, right? So there's great guys at all the big twos and all the small guys too. So it makes for an interesting marketplace, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot more competitive, but at the same time too, I think com com competitiveness breeds something as well too. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see. Definitely. Right. And and getting back to like the Kickstarters, like one of the things that we've been trying to wrap our heads around is not only the creative side of it, but also like the distribution side. So when it comes to um, when we're fulfilling the yeah. the orders and I back Jimmy Palmiotti's Trigger Girl 6 and I've got it here. Mm -hmm. So great cover. And the thing that impressed me the most about this and it actually is informing how we're going to be, you know, um, putting out our books is it came in this plastic kind of um, package. Let me just zoom it back here. And yeah, yeah. it was one of those things like, so you, you open up the, um, let's see how it fits. It fits in here pretty neatly. And mm -hmm. the cool thing about it was when you get the normal packaging, right? Like different creators have different ways of, you know, based on their budgets on getting the books to you and what the packaging's like. So there's some that come in just a regular um, kind of mailing envelope that mm -hmm. is a little bit harder stock. And then there's some that come in like these amazing gatefold kind of, um, kind of gatefold covers that are fantastic. Oh, yeah, like like yeah, like that. Gemini. Yeah, Gemini yeah. is the, I think that, are they the company that we're going with? Yeah, the Gemini mailers, yeah. That's yeah, the so the Gemini doing. mailers, and it's kind of like a transformer, so, you know, tr -tr 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 opens up, you put your book in the sleeve, and yeah. then you can put all your, um, like, bookmarks or stickers or flyers or whatever in there, and everything is protected. Yeah. But what you'll get normally is you'll get a you'll get the book or the books that you've ordered through the Kickstarters or whatever the crowdfunding source would be, and they're just in the regular bags and boards that you would get in the, in the comic book shop. But Paul Miotti's, um book came in that mailer. And I was like, this is fantastic because if your if your if your book is out in the elements sitting on your on your porch for a bit, you know, and you're not home to pick it up right away, that's another way, Canada, another baby. layer added layer of protection. Sorry, say that again. I'll take Canada, baby. <laughs> oh yeah, right. You know, so if, if you're mailing <laughs> stuff in like anywhere from like November to March. <laughs> it could be sitting in the snow, you know, we could, you know, get our fair set of rain up here too. But like, it's just that little extra, a bit of thought that went into, you know, the packaging and the fulfillment of the product to the consumer that I was really impressed with. And so I remember mentioning it to you and said, I think I'd like to do that for Atrium. And oh yeah, so and we got that. We'll be doing we got that. Our, yeah, we got our little things in and I just did a little mock-up one. So mm -hmm. we have these ones, just straight black, right? Yeah. But these ones are bit, like they got the bubble as well too. So just to kind of a little bit added. So, mm -hmm. and then got the uh, then we got the Gemini uh, mailer in there with the whole transformer thing going on. So you can kind of put your books in there, right? And we got like a sticker and all that kind of stuff and whatnot. So I have a little sample book in there. This one's Mark Millar's big game, but those will be ours, right? And then um, those are what we'll be sending out to people. So I think, like you said, it's that little bit of fine touch that kind of shows that you appreciate the people that backed it and you kind of want to show a little bit of additional professionalism as well too, mm -hmm. right? And because of what you're putting out there into the ether, right? Versus just slabbing it in just a UPS envelope and shipping it out. Next thing you know, your book is all bent and crushed by the time it gets to you and dog-eared. Yeah, I'll, I'll like never forget, I think this was on Mike Ruth's Instagram feed. Yeah. Where one of the books, I don't know if it was a sketch cover or if it was one of his kickstarted oh, yeah. books. I think and it, sketch looked, it looked like it was mangled by like a rancor or something out of Star yeah. Wars. Like it was yeah. this book was just absolutely torn to shreds. Obliterated. And yeah. And it, and it was like, uh, you, you kind of breaks your heart seeing the damage done to the book. And yeah. so it was always, you know, on top of mind when we were getting our, our book in order. Like, how do we do the best to prevent that? Like, I know there's never, you know, a hundred percent guarantee no. on that. Like always something can happen, but mm -hmm. the more you can do to kind of just ensure that the customer, especially, you know, when you factor in the shipping rates and all that kind of stuff that, 
that yeah. you have to um, charge them, you want to make sure that they're getting their book and and they're actually getting their money's worth. Oh, totally. And the thing about it too is when you actually do the initial shipping rate and then you add these other things, you're talking like fractions of a gram. So you're not really that much of a variance to be able to just put them in these type of protective um, bags or even the mailers, right? Because mm -hmm. Gemini mailers are decently expensive, but the, the bags itself, Amazon sells these by the droves. I think I got um, 50 of them for under 20 bucks or something like that. Okay. So just Amazon primed it and that was, that was pretty easy to go. Right. Um, and then it only added like maybe, I don't even think it was half a gram of weight to the whole thing. So it was nothing crazy when it comes down to did it, it didn't really impact our cushion in regards to our shipping rates, right? When we we're going to send these out with chit chat, right? So yeah, I think it's worth, worth it in the end, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, the, um, the next week we'll be all on pins and needles waiting for our books to arrive and then we can start fulfilling those orders. Oh yeah, that's gonna be great. Well, <laughs> uh, we'll be hopefully we'll be back next week as well too, and then um, we'll be able to at least let people know and show them some samples of where we are at with everything and kind of go from there. But I'll probably be updating everybody on Instagram as well too. So if, be sure to check us out on Instagram, YouTube, and so forth to kind of keep abreast of where we are with everything, right? And we look to create more content around everything that we're trying to do here, guys, right? So, um, well. I think that's pretty much it for us for the today, right? Yeah, so we'll, we're going to wrap it up here, but uh, thanks again for listening and we'll be in touch with you guys soon. All right. Take care. All right, guys. Everybody keep it indie.